everyone and welcome to Modern Horror. Though in this case that's not entirely accurate because today I'd like to take a look at cult classic Night of the Demons which was released in 1988. But it was remade in 2009 which is easily what I'd consider modern. So Night of the Demons is definitely one of the, the less talked about horror franchises birthed from the fertile womb of the 1980s. But it has been pretty successful in its own right. The uh, campy Spam in a Cabin series produced two of its own sequels that elevated its demonic and ironically named Angela into the pantheon of horror icons. Then 20-ish years later, the original's director, Kevin Tenney, produced a reboot written by husband and wife team Adam Girish and Jay Sanderson. Unfortunately, this movie went direct to DVD and attempts to kickstart a sequel had failed, so this remake stands alone. Now with two movies here, there's a lot of material and I don't want to get bogged down, so I have contracted my lawyer to assist me. I won't do it. It's undignified. I have a law degree, damn it. It's prestigious. Look, I'm paying you, aren't I? Five dollars. Okay, okay. How's this? I have a magic fork. That tells the future. What about that? Prove it. Fork! Speak unto me the secrets of the future. You have a Ruben for lunch. It won't be very good. Eh? Eh? Pretty good. God. Fine. <coughs> <coughs> Alright, that helps. Anyway, Angela's throwing a party, so let's go. Now, the original opens up with a pretty lengthy animated title sequence of Halloween Night Beginning and all of the creepy ghoulies rising from the grave to haunt. It looks pretty cool, and I think it does a good job at setting uh, expectations at the appropriate, you know, B-movie funhouse level. The opening theme here is actually pretty awesome. Being 80s synth pop, it does feel a bit dated and has moments where it falls back into, like, uh, 16-bit video game music, but on the whole, it sounds pretty full otherwise. The whole soundtrack is actually really good. And aside from a few contemporary goth rock bands, the whole thing was composed entirely by the director's brother, Dennis. Rather than animated sequence, the new one starts off with an old-timey flashback of a Halloween party gone horrifyingly wrong. This nicely shows off the history of the house rather than the somewhat awkward exposition dumps used in the original movie. From there, we jump to a Halloween parade 85 years later. Now, I really like this song. It's contemporary, but it's still cheeky and fun like the original. Also, they play it constantly in the DVD special features, and it really wormed its way into my brain. Anyway, how are the characters doing over in 88? Uh, oh, well, how do I put this? They're complete raging assholes. With the possible exception of Helen, I mean, Stooge here is driving while drinking, and the first thing that Roger does is point out a random old guy so that Stooge can moon him from the passenger seat after abandoning the steering wheel mid-motion. I mean, thankfully, it's not a full moon, just pumpkin spice underwear, for which I am glad. I want to see precisely none of Stooge's hairy naked manners. Oh, poor old man, your trials this night are just beginning. Stooge and company drive off to find more strangers to be complete douchebags too, but we stay with the old man as he encounters the next character, Sal, who is a uh, leaner and meaner brand of tool in the Rob Lane mold. Hey, up yours with a twirling lime mold. Followed closely by nice girl Judy, whose attempted kindness goes entirely unappreciated. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Get your hands off of me. Hey, calm down. Get away from me. I They'll get what they deserve. Tonight. <laughs> well shit, Harold, the apple's upside down. We'll never get the product placement money if they can't read the label. Take it again from the top. Judy goes home to change so that we can see her butt, let's be honest, and she takes a phone call from her 20-something teenage boyfriend, Jay, who convinces her to go to Angela's party instead of the school Halloween dance. <laughs> I have to say I'm incredibly amused here that they're underlining his bland preppiness by having him eat vanilla wafers. A quick jump scare from Jamie Lannister, the early years, <laughs> Wow, prodigious booby, sis! functions as an excuse to show off a mostly see-through bra. Meanwhile, across town, Linnea Quigley's butt. And this is shaping up to be a very ass-centric movie. She is distracting these two dopey convenience store attendants while Angela shovels half the store into a gigantic bag. Jay goes to pick Judy up, and her mom tries tempting him with confectionery that- Your candy looks like poop. Hey, play nice! They look like sun-dried poodle turds. 
Man, what is with these slasher movie characters riffing their own movies? I feel like I'm an Enter the Song of the South or some shit. While Stooge's crew is getting lost because they're too busy being dicks to each other. Stooge, you become an asshole of your own free will or were you born that way? Jay and Judy go to pick up our last two characters, Fran and Max. Now, we've got a few too many characters to use the Cabin in the Woods archetypes here, since that's a result of several more years worth of distilling that formula, but uh, let's see what we can do. Whore. Virgin. Athlete. Fool. Scholar. Uh, token black guy. Warm body. Warm body. Warm body. So how do they round things out in 2009? Our first character is Angela and her awkwardly robotic cat. She's got a bit of a Dr. Claw thing going on. I'll get you next time, Gadget. But we'll catch up with her later. Next up are Lily in the traditional slutty cat costume and her friend Maddie in the somewhat less traditional but more genre savvy slasher victim costume. Or Hussy, Jezebel, Tara. While they trade some friendly jabs, Suzanne shows up in the traditional slutty cat costume. No, oh, how embarrassing. Meanwhile, across town, Linnea Quigley's butt. Hey, are you still in my lines? It's a cameo. She's dressed as the original Suzanne. Jason and Dex's keen sense of justice is on display when Wilhelm von Douche steals candy from a little kid and Jason snipes him with paintballs. Our last character is Colin, who's not part of the original group, but is dealing drugs at the party to pay off his supplier so he gets to keep breathing. I wanted to play the archetype game with this round of victims, Big ones like Virgin, Whore, and Fool, those are easy, the whole thing falls apart after that. The original had a much larger cast of 10, while this time out we've only got 7 people. This is also a post-stream deconstruction world, the rules are a little different, you know? The remaining 4 characters don't have any obvious traits to put them into any of the last two archetypes, and realistically a lot of the traits are shared between the characters. I'm considering it progress because they're better fleshed out than the one-note jerks in the original. Hey, and speaking of one-note jerks... Let's party! And party they do with their illicitly gained snacks, booze, 80s rock, and gratuitous ass shots. At least until the batteries in the boombox die and leave them without radical tunage. I know it's not fair since this is a for-profit rager and that was a few kids breaking in somewhere to drink beer and hook up, but this party is much more interesting to watch and it feels a lot more energetic. Angela is given a nice dramatic introduction, giving the partygoers a speech followed by a montage of the party going well, and Suzanne gets dangerously drunk. However, all good things must come to an end, and the police show up and shut down the party because Angela apparently forgot to get all the right permits. Should have called the skeleton lawyer. Just saying. Once everybody else gets escorted out, our main cast comes back in. Anyway, to get the demonic portion of the evening underway, the Scooby Gang finds a hidden room in the basement while looking for Colin's drugs. Since modern Scream Queen Tiffany Sheppis turned tail and ran off with all the money from the party store charges after her cameo ended, Angela's pretty hard up for rent money, so she tries to steal the gold teeth from the skeletons they find in the room. Which is a bad, bad decision. Us skeletons are scrappy. We'll bite a mofo. Ow! <laughs> it bit her! Okay, anyway. Back in the 80s, Angela tries to keep the party going by suggesting a seance, and as luck would have it, they find a mirror in the back large enough for them all to look into for a past life seance. A what? A past life seance. You know, we all sit around, look in a mirror, and see our past lives. Now honestly, given that there's like 10 people at this party, half of them are assholes and they all seem to hate each other, I think the real miracle here is that they've agreed to sit quietly and stare at a mirror together. Surprisingly for them, the seance actually works and awakens this awesome looking insectoid dragon demon thing which freaks the hell out of Helen and then knocks the mirror over. The camera work has been pretty dynamic so far, but I really love this shot of the group all in different chunks of the mirror here and think it deserves special mention. Nowadays this would be no big deal with digital compositing, but this was low budget in 1988. So they had to set all these pieces of mirror up and position the actors so they'd be reflected in the right piece and so that you wouldn't be able to see the camera. And then they just shot it like that. It's, it's actually a really impressive piece of work. Anyway, the demon reanimates from the mortuary's crematorium and takes an Evil Dead style tracking shot upstairs where it possesses Suzanne. <laughs> What's the difference between possessed and haunted? 
And thanks for the totally natural setup, Judy. Angela tries to tell everyone that the house is possessed by demons versus being haunted by ghosts with some incredibly cheesy dialogue. They have never existed in human form. They've only existed in spirit form. They're pure evil. They're demons. Yeah! Eat a bowl of fuck! <laughs> I am here to party! Yeah. Oh, dear lord. Stooge is such an asshole. I think he's got like a gravitational field. Except instead of gravity, it's being an unrepentant jackass. I actually like the rest of the cast a bit less when they're standing closer to Stooge. Or could it be the Raj here just had too much cold beer and blew us a cool, stiff breeze right out of his bottle? <laughs> Shut up and drive, bitch! Y'all say hi to Casper for me. <laughs> no, you! Yes, Raj! No! Back to the future. With the party broken up, the core friends commiserate in the ruins and drink the leftover booze. Demonic Angela rolls in and engineers an excuse to get her Mac on and spread the possession. Dex is a lucky winner, and Angela mounts up, much to Lily's chagrin, so she hauls him upstairs to remind him where his bread's buttered. We'll come back to them later, let's finish splitting up the group first. Maddie wants Colin to leave because they're exes and that's awkward. Colin wants to leave because he needs to figure out a way to appease his dealer, so the two of them go out and try to find a gate or something. Angela just makes Jason feel awkward enough that he goes with Maddie and Colin, leaving Angela alone with Suzanne. Uh, wait up, guys, I'm, I'm coming with you. <clears throat> I really like how they did that. It's a, it's a much more natural way to isolate everyone. There are motivations behind all the actions. I mean, in the original, it just seemed like everyone's established, someone's possessed, so the next step is to split them up and start killing them off. I mean, Max and Franny go to hook up. Jay takes Judy away because he wants to hook up. Suzanne makes Stooge think they're going to hook up. You see what I mean? It's a bit of a one-trick pony. I mean, the only people here who aren't hooking up are Helen and Roger, because she's too freaked out to stay and he's seen this movie and wants to subvert genre tropes. Anyway, demonic showpiece. Despite being so ill from fresh possession they somewhat deliriously stumbling around and leaning on the wall, Dex manages to stand and deliver for a living. Regular condoms do not offer protection from sexually transmitted demons. You need the condom of God. Get your nethers papily blessed. Warning, papal blessing does not prevent against side effects of premarital sex, so stay home and stop fucking. Glossing over some ghost stories and haunted house hijinks for the sake of time, we get to one of this film's major showpieces, which is Angela's dance sequence. Along with Sal, Angela has this wild dance scene set to the only part of the soundtrack not composed by Dennis Tenney the song Stigmata Martyr by Bauhaus. Now they actually cast a professional dancer to play Angela so that she could choreograph this herself. I'm kind of partial to the part where the strobe light comes on and they start cutting the different takes so it looks like she's just teleporting around. Anyway, since Sal is pretty smart behind the, the top guy exterior, he bows out, but Stooge is back after Suzanne blew him off by beginning her demonic transformation and vanishing. Now Angela kicks off the demonic killing spree here by eating Stooge's tongue. Unfortunately, back in the remake, Shannon and Elizabeth is not a dream dancer, so Angela's dance is just a seductive slow dance set to Peter Steele's always superlative and sorely missed rich gothic sex voice. As much as I'd like to keep listening to Typo Negative, the scene ends when Suzanne realizes they're floating a foot above the ground and Angela rips her freaking face off. Next! As famed B-movie director Jim Wynorski said, breasts are the cheapest special effect. Here are Suzanne's. Though this movie is fine with putting a little bit of budget into its breasts, and in this case, uh, lips, they're right in the... Oh dear. In the remake, they've tried to one-up the original by... Oh. Oh dear. Having... Oh, good god, having the lipstick come back out. I have regrets. Hey, at least there's actually another character here to see it happen. I mean, in the original it was only there for the audience. It's actually a bit disappointing that they didn't include a showpiece like that in the story. 
And it was a big deal to use such a large silicone prosthetic in 1988. I mean, the stuff was around, but it didn't really get popular until the mid-90s. So the original still looks good, but in the 80s, this would have looked amazingly real. There's not a whole lot of remake left since 57% of the cast are now demons. In the original, 30% are down by the time Angela makes her first kill. Care to catch up first? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, the remake here hits the same sorts of notes, but in a, a slightly different order. In this case, the note is a demonic character demonizing another while they're screwing. Anyway, the killing must continue and in wanders Jay having left Judy alone because he was hoping to get lucky and she just wasn't putting out in the parlance of the time. Of course, Suzanne is happy to put out. Jay's eyes. While all this is going on, Helen has reappeared outside, free falling face first into Angela's car that Roger is sleeping in. This conflicts me. While my more juvenile judgment wants to call off-screen death kind of lame, I like how this calls back to what she saw in the mirror during the seance. But back to good and simple nudity as Max and Franny's cough and sex is interrupted by a now demonic Most of the rest of the movie consists of Sal, Judy, and Roger running from the various possessed versions of their former companions. Sal eventually goes down when Angela throws him off a roof as he's trying to save Judy. Remake plays about the same, with the next large chunk being the three survivors running from their demonic friends until the demon's fake sunrise. Good on you, demons. The gang found some protection spells in the walls of a room, along with some exposition dump that laid out the background that these demons are exiled from hell for getting uppity and trying to out evil Satan. Loophole being that they can possess seven living people before the end of Halloween, they get to roam free on Earth. So they're on ticking clock to survive until dawn. So the demons fake a sunrise, which lures our heroes out into the open, where all four attack at once, and Jason goes down. While running away, Colin falls through the floor and becomes a demon after Maddie sets his massively broken leg. The demons finally corner Maddie just before sunrise, and she jumps out the window with a rope around her neck, just like Evangeline Broussard did in the opening. Since they weren't able to get the Seven Souls before daybreak, the demons burn off. However, Maddie had only faked the noose, so she unties the rope around her waist and walks off, quipping before what's sure to be years of alcoholism and psychotherapy. Demons. <laughs> Not so smart. To cap off the original film, the demons can't cross the underground river that this wall happens to be built directly over, so Judy and Roger manage to climb over it to safe. To clean things up, the demons melt when the sun rises and the leads shuffle directly off into the waiting arms of alcoholism and psychotherapy. Hey, who's still in whose lies? Hey now, tell me I'm wrong. Anyway, the movie closes on a pretty amusing note when the crazy old man from the beginning is killed by his own razor blade apples, which his wife has baked into a pie. Happy Halloween, dear. And that's that. I can easily see why the original movie became the cult hit that it is. The special effects are really good and creative, it's got a great tongue-in-cheek sense of humor, and the kills are all pretty unapologetic. All the TNA probably didn't hurt at the time either. But if we're being honest, I think I like the remake a little bit better. The original story was a pretty low effort setup to get some teens together into a haunted house and then kill them off, while the remake is just generally better put together. In addition to some of the issues that I've already mentioned, the remake just seemed to have better characters. Stooge, Roger, Jay, and Sal were all pretty awful people, and I really thought that that entire cast hated each other. Jason, Dex, Maddie, Suzanne, and Lily may have been pretty bland, but they seemed nice enough, and the characters actually seemed like friends. But while I really appreciated the remake's story and characters over the original, I don't really like its special effects quite as much as the originals. The new demonic Suzanne was actually pretty cool, but the new Angela just looks awful. And Black Lagoon Lily is fun, but she seems a bit out of place. It just generally lacked Steve Johnson's finesse and cohesive vision. Also, despite being in a much more interesting setting, I felt like it lacked the visual directorial flair of the original, and only really outdid it during the opening song and the entrance to the party because those scenes had so much built-in spectacle. Those were really the only scenes that felt like they had the, the Halloween spirit to me. But both movies are really good spam in a cabin flicks without a doubt. Whew. That was a thing. Anyway, thank you so much for checking out some modern horror. Feel free to leave a comment below, and also please subscribe to be notified of new videos. Again, thanks for watching. Cheers, and happy Halloween. I like big 
Bacene kenarlar Yukarı bana sketin 